Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? All the way up there. Welcome to my session. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about going back to basics. And I'm going to mean that in a couple of different ways. So I'm Victor Klang. I work for a company called TypeSafe. Um, this is my Twitter handle if you feel like you want to have opinions. All right, so one thing that is fairly apparent right now, I would say, and uh, please, if you disagree, just shout and say that you disagree, but I think that software is becoming increasingly interconnected. So it's no longer a single person executing a program from start to finish and inspecting the output. But programs are actually being composed with other programs and running for the benefits of other programs. Many times without even having a person involved at all in the execution or inspection of the results of a program. Do you feel like you agree with that? Awesome. That's good. So that's the axiom of the talk. All right, so what is a system? We're programmers. We write systems, create systems. Or rather, do we encode systems? Because a system is a set of things working, working together as a part of a mechanism or an interconnecting network, a complex whole. Right? What does that even, that's sort of fluffy, right? What does that even mean? Well, I think, technically, we are systems living within systems, living within systems, living within systems. So everything is sort of like systems all the way down. We have complex things which appear very, very simple. So what do I mean by that? Well. If you look at a system, its purpose is typically very simple. Take a watch, for instance, a very, very classic wound wristwatch. Its purpose is to let the wearer or someone else that asks what time it is to know what time it is. But if you've seen how these wristwatches are implemented, you might know that there are hundreds of small, small parts that makes this very simple purpose come to life. So the system itself could be extremely complex, but typically the purpose of the system is simple. Do you agree with me? Is it too early? Okay. <laughs> So complex inner workings, things working together to provide some sort of functionality or do something. That means that they're collaborating, right? So components that collaborate to form a system to do something. So what's interesting, as I mentioned before, is systems within systems within systems. So a team. A, developer, a development team could be a system that lives within a larger system, which is called the IT department, which lives within a larger system called the company, which lives within a larger system called the state, which lives within a larger system called the world, which happens to be something that lives within a planetary system, which lives within a, a universe, and so everything is systems within systems. One observation is that it tends to be that components are as simple as feasible, but not simpler. So there is a local maximum of component complexity. Because they have to do exactly what they're supposed to do, good enough, so that they aren't replaced with something else. But you can't, com can't replace something with something that is worse perpetually, because that will just degrade your entire system. So there tends to be an optimization strategy going on. I think 
First and foremost, programming is not about solving problems at all. Programming is about encoding solutions for a machine to execute. So if you cannot solve the problem without programming, you can't solve the problem at all. Because you'll have to encode it for the machine to understand it, and in order to be able to encode it, you'll have to solve the problem. Does that make sense? Because I know, as a developer, it's so easy when you're confronted with a problem to think, I'm going to need this framework, I'm going to need this thing, I'm going to connect those things, and I'm going to do that thing, and I'm going to ship that thing. But perhaps it makes much more sense to just take a step back and say, hmm, interesting problem. How would I solve this if I hadn't got a computer or a programming language? Because there was a time before computers where people solve problems. So if we accept that programming is the encoding of a solution for a machine to execute, we can solve problems without programming. So what is the most common developer task? Any guess? Drinking coffee. That is a very common task. Oh, oh. <laughs> Looking at logs? Reading logs, yeah. <laughs> Reading logs. That is a very common task as well. Tasks. Sorry? Updating tasks? Updating tasks? Writing code? Writing code? Think. Thinking. Thinking is good. Yeah. <laughs> the end? <laughs> What about receiving inputs? Is that common? Receiving some sort of input to do something with? Can we accept that that is a very common task? Cool. How about transforming some data? Like you, you get some input and you need to transform it in some way? Like do something with the input? Are we good? Sounds fair enough. How about producing outputs? Right? Processing. Processing. Yeah, so we have inputs, transformation, outputs. V very common dev tasks. Receive the inputs, do some transformation, produce some outputs. That sounds pretty cool. What if there was something that lets you do this? That would be, that would be great, right? So, Let's talk a bit about streams. So just before everybody has like their own 100 million different definitions of the word streams, let's just it's undefined streams. So let's just start from, from blank and let's define streams. So what is a stream? It's a source of information, right? Inputs, perhaps some transformation of information and perhaps some production of outputs, like a flow of information. Does that make sense? Can we keep it general enough? Stream some inputs to some outputs. Most commonly, what we do is that we don't just take the inputs and just output the inputs, because we're typically not in the sort of the file copy industry, but some do. So I'm going to talk a bit about ACA streams, which is an implementation of the idea of streams. Um, and what was important when we started doing ACA streams was, what is ACA streams? How is it supposed to work? We want to make it easier to receive inputs, transform data, produce outputs. What kind of characteristics do you need to have in order to make that a good thing or a pleasurable experience, but also interesting stuff like how do you operate this? How can we make sure that people don't get into bad situations? Buzzword bingo. But these are sort of the core, core words behind ACA streams. So we wanted to have a representation 
of transformation, which is immutable, because it means that it can be shared, it can be passed around in your program, it can be reused, you can reason about it. Reused, reusable is good, right? You don't have to write the order processing logic eight times. Pretty good, we don't have to fix the bugs eight times either. So if we have something that is reusable and immutable, it would be pretty awesome if we could compose it as well. So we can take different parts and connect them together, like pipes, like in plumbing, pull, put things together. Another thing that we feel is important, and I think you also feel is important, that we're able to leverage the computational power that we have access to. So we want to have a library or a tool that allows us to exploit having multiple cores, for instance. But that means that we are entering concurrency country, which means that we need to have some sort of coordination. We need to make sure that this works across these threads. And once we have something that can leverage multiple cores, it's fairly important that it's asynchronous. Because otherwise, if you start the processing of a stream, and it's synchronous, you're going to block the current thread until that stream processing is done. So imagine, for instance, that you are in the business of taking sensor data and collecting that and transform it and insert it to some database because you want to calculate statistics or clean up data. That could be a potentially unbounded source of information. So your current thread will be stalled for an unbounded amount of time. So if we can create something, it would be really good if that was asynchronous so we could reuse the current thread for something else, possibly another stream. And of course, what do we want to focus on? I think that is transformation, because as I said before, just taking bytes in and bytes out and not doing anything with them that is a very, very slim use case. So what is the actual problem here? So we want to do streaming, want to take inputs, transform them, produce outputs, leverage a lot of cores, and potentially even going across the network and do all kinds of cool stuff. So what is the core problem here? I think the core problem is to get data across an asynchronous boundary. So you have things working at different speeds, potentially in different locations. How do we get data from A to B? How do we make sure that we coordinate that? Because synchronous is easy. We just hand it off on the stack and it just works. But if we want to be asynchronous, we want to make sure that we solve the problem. So what happens if the receiver can't receive as fast as the sender sends. Is there no back pressure here? Because if you have a fire hydrant and you want to drink from it, it would be pretty nice if you could deal with only drinking as much as you want to drink, rather than drinking from the fire hydrant. Right? And especially in a fan-out situation where you have multiple streams going out, how do you deal with the back pressure? You can't do the raccoon method. It does not work. So the real challenge is to do this with back pressure. And as we want to be asynchronous, we need to do it in a non-blocking way. We can't block the current thread. So when we started doing this, we sort of figured that we were definitely not alone in having this problem. So how many of you have heard about the Reactive Streams initiative? Wow. Very cool. That's almost like half of the audience. So we started checking with others in the same space. Do you also have the same problem? Or are you also working on a solution? Or are you willing to work on a solution for this problem? And so we did, and it worked, and it's done. And it looks like in the last JDK 9 early accesses that it's going to be in JDK 9. That's pretty successful, I think. 
set out to solve the problem, but we managed to solve a problem in, in, in a good way, which means that it's possible to integrate in the JDK. So if we want to compare different methods of dealing with back pressure, or not, So we have some requirements that we want to achieve or live up to. And we have push and pull, which are the most common ones. So if we want to support potentially unbounded sequences of information, so you have potentially an unbounded source of inputs. We want to be able to support that. We don't want to just have bounded ones or finite ones. And both push and pull as a, as a way of solving this actually solves that because in a push situation, the sender just sends the information. Doesn't matter how much information there is, he just pushes the information. And in a pull scenario, the receiver pulls information, and it doesn't matter if it's infinite or not, or unbounded or not. But then again, as we said before, hmm, we need to support the case where the sender might be slower, or the receiver might be slower. So sender runs separately from receiver. Yeah, we can have the sender run there, and we can have the, the, the receiver run somewhere else. It's not tied together, tightly coupled. We could send something, we could push something over a network, or pull something over, over a network. So here's what I talked about before. We need to have the rate of reception may vary from the rate of sending. So we don't want, want to force, um, force them to always work in tandem, or it only works if they run in tandem, which is true, right? We can just, if we push, we have to drop. If we can't receive it, we'll just have to drop. And when we pull, we just pull what we want, so we'll be able to pull when we need more information. But the problem becomes, if we want to have a requirement that says we only want to drop elements or drop data as a choice, not by necessity. So we don't want to be forced to discard information. Well, that doesn't work with a push model, right? So the, the sender that pushes the information has no idea of whether the, the sender is receiving it, right? He just pushes. doesn't make a difference. He doesn't know that it's getting dropped. And if we want to have something that is high speed, well, then pull doesn't really work. Because if you need to pull every element out of that stream, if you think about it from a message passing point of view, you'll have to send one pull message to the sender, and the sender then responds with the data. So now we have two messages for every single element of data. So that's quite a bit of overhead. What if we can solve this if we model it as supply and demand? That was our general thought. So we have supply of data, and then the receiver has a demand for data. So it's like going into the store, wanting to buy ice creams. Perhaps you say, I want 10 ice creams. That's your demand of data. And then the store clerk is responsible for making sure that they deliver 10 ice creams. Hmm. Should make sense, right? So if we model this in the, as I said before, with the first thing argue with naming, I think we spent like two months argue with naming. So it's called a publisher, the thing that sends information, and the thing that receives information is called a subscriber. And the publisher publishes data, and the subscriber demands data. Two flows of information, right? Hmm. So what's the difference between this and the pull model? Or just pulling information? Well, as I said before, we can demand something more than one. We can say we want 10 ice creams. We want long max value ice creams. So we can amortize the fact that we're asking for data. 
So one interesting observation we did is that if you have a splitting situation or a broadcast situation, where you have multiple subscribers to the same source of data, you're effectively merging the demand. If I have to send to A and B, and I only have demand from A, then can I send now, or how long do I wait until I send to them? Because I can't let A diverge too much from B, because then I'll have to buffer all that data. So it's essentially a, a merging of the demand, saying that when I have demand from A and B, I can send information downstream to both. What's interesting is the inverse as well. So if you're merging two streams of data, you're splitting the demand. You're saying that I want one from you and one from you, but I only get one element out. All right. Everybody with me so far? Anybody lost? I can't see you up there, but if you, if you shout, I will, I will make an effort. So, the interesting observation here is that it becomes effectively a push model sometimes, right? If the subscriber wants more information than is available from the publisher, it means that the publisher can always send. So there's always demand, so I can always send. Effectively a push model, I can just push. When it's the other way around, it becomes a pull model, because the publisher cannot publish unless there is demand. So when the subscriber needs more data, he pulls, quote unquote, the data out. So what's super interesting about this is this all changes and switches automatically during runtime. Because as the subscriber or publisher is faster, it switches between these modes. So it sort of balances out over time. And as I said, you can batch the demand. And send, instead of say, I want one, I want one, you can say, I want 10, and then I want five, and then I want 100. And batching the demand means that you're essentially allowing the publisher to say, OK, you want 100, so I'll prime and create 100. You're able to make decisions based on how much demand is downstream. So you can think a bit about it as a sort of a dynamic push-pull. Switches automatically between push and pull. Without, without the, the, the user having to do something. So how does that work? What's the protocol? What does it look in code? So this is the entirety of the interfaces in the specification. This is Java. This is one slide. Pretty awesome. Keep in mind, though, that this is not an end user application developer interface or, or specification. This is more of an integrator specification. Because everything that implements these interfaces and follows the specification, they will just work with everything else that implements the interfaces and follows the specification. So this is, there's very little API because you have multiple different languages on the JVM. You possibly have multiple other languages that you want to integrate with. Everybody has their own flavor of APIs and style, how you do things. Everyone has different uh, capabilities. So by not constraining the specification with API choices, you can distill the, spe the specification to the bare minimum. And if you only have the bare minimum, it's much more easy to reason about. So what you have is a publisher, a subscriber, a subscription, and a processor. And the reason we have processor there is because it's, it's very hard in Java to say publisher and subscriber as a type. So it means that everybody would create this type because a processor is something that takes input, does something with it, and produces output seems like a fairly useful thing, so having that as a standard type makes sense. And as you also can see, when you request information in, in the subscription, request is the demand. So you're saying request 100 elements. Does this look fairly clear? Cool. 
So just to illustrate a bit about the mechanics. The subscriber places itself into the subscribe method of the publisher. The publisher creates a subscription for that subscriber and passes that to the unsubscribe method of the subscriber. So that's sort of a handshake. I'm interested in data here. Here's how you get data. Pretty simple. So how does the data flow start? Well, the subscriber has to ask for data, right? Before the publisher can send data. So it requests one or X from its subscription. And then the publisher is able or willing and, and allowed to send an element on the next method of the subscriber. And of course, there is no relationship between having to request and having to get the on next. So you can call request multiple times to aggregate the information. And then the publisher can then send that information. Make sense? Fairly simple. And we can request some more information. We can send some more elements. So in the, in the case where we have an unbounded source of information that just produces the number one forever, there is no natural end or completion of the stream, right? But a lot of streams have some sort of completion. So how do we complete a quote-unquote stream? Well, if we send the information and once we know or the publisher knows that the information is no longer available, he can just call the oncomplete method on the subscriber. Super simple. But in the case where there is some sort of catastrophic failure, where we aren't able to send any more information from the publisher, something happened, we're not able to produce anything. We'll have to let the subscriber know that we didn't complete successfully. It's not end of stream. This is some error that happened. Something blows up. The publisher just calls on error, passes an exception down there, and then the subscriber knows what happened. Super, super simple, right? So if we go back and we compare these things, we can actually see that we address the push case because we don't have to drop information because we request information. And also we offset the cost of pulling by amortizing the demand, right? So we ask for 100, we send one demand message per 100 elements. So just to give you a sense of the implementations, we have Arca Streams, Project Reactor, Rat Pack, uh, Slick, Vertex. There are integrations for several, both the databases and uh, IO libraries, uh, much more on the way. And what's interesting about this is that if you have a database and it has a Reactive Streams interface, you can connect your Reactive Streams based thing with that and you get the transitive properties, the back pressure, without having to do anything. So let, let's talk more concretely about Aga Streams. So one of the core components in Aka streams are sources, flows, and sinks. What is a source? Anyone? Something that produces data. Something that produces data, yes. Very, hopefully the name sort of reflects what it does. That was the intent. Very fierce naming, dis naming discussion again. And a flow is the equivalent of a processor, right? So it's something that takes input and it has one open thing on the left side and it produces something one open end on the, on the other side. And then we have sinks. And sinks consume data, produce output, does things with data. And when you connect these pieces together, you can connect sources to sinks directly. You can connect source via flows into sinks. Once you have all the open ports closed or connected, it becomes a runnable graph. And once you have a runnable graph, you can now run it because it now has everything connected together. 
So let's do a qu quick live demo. All right. Scala code? Everybody okay? Awesome. So let's say that we want to have some source of information, we want to connect it through some sort of transformation, and we want to pipe it through some sync. We want to do something with it. So let's say we have a source of uh, one to thousand. Sorry? Oh, you can't see it. Ah. That's not reasonable. Let's push it. Can we push it out there? Can you see it now? That's amazing. All right. So what we want to do Let's take something that is less uh, perhaps complete. Can everybody see this? Are we good? Slightly, can we zoom in here? Are we good now? Yes, awesome. So let's say that we want to do something. We want to have a source of information. And in this case, we have a source of the numbers 1 to 1,000. Fairly simple, right? But this is a source. So this is now immutable, and we can refer to it, and we can reuse it. So technically, if we want to do a transformation, let's say we want to... Uh, take all the numbers and times two, because that is a very useful thing to do. We have a flow of ints, and we want to map that, and we want to take the number times two, right? So now we have a flow that takes ints, and takes for every int, it does times two on the int. Everybody with me so far? Awesome. All right, we have a transformation. We can refer to this transformation because it's immutable. What if we want to have a destination? So let's say we want to print these new awesome numbers. We want to produce outputs. So we do for each, and we do print line. All right, so for everything, this is a sync, takes things and calls this print line. So sends things to system out. So if we want to make this run, we have sync via transformation to destination. We have connected a source via transformation to a sync. I want to see if this actually runs. Do you believe me? I should probably not do that. Right? Printed out numbers times two. We good? So we have these pieces that we can reuse, we can connect together, and we can execute when we want to. So technically, what we have here is a runnable graph. And we can run them how many times we want. And this thing actually returns a runnable graph, so let's just do this for example. So now we have three different runnable graphs that run. Right? Is this magical, or does it seem like useful things? Or both? 
Both. All right, so we have a means of describing transformation that we can reuse. That allows us to have back pressure. You see nothing here that relates to back pressure, right? It's completely, completely hidden behind the scenes. All right, let's go back to the... Can we see this? Awesome. All right. One thing that I find extremely useful, how many of you have ever tried to implement a network protocol? Yeah? Fair enough. How many of you have ever taken things from a file, had to decode it, and then had to do some transformation and re-encode it, put it into another file, right? Yeah? Like CSV, do stuff with it, produce another CSV? Same thing, right? Taking that thing with the CSV and the decoding and doing stuff, that is a protocol, right? We do something with it, and we do the reverse on the other side. A bidirectional flow can be seen as something which has two directions. One input in one direction, and one output in that direction, and one input in another direction, so it's sort of upside down. So you can flow things through it in one direction and flow things through it in the other direction. What's interesting is that since it's one thing, it can short circuit. So think of how many of you have ever used uh, TLS in Java? How many of you are OK? Are you OK? <laughs> You're OK. TLS is a very typical example of this because TLS does things like renegotiations and stuff. So being able to short circuit be between the inputs and outputs when you need to is fairly useful. What's interesting about bidirectional flows is that you can stack them on top of each other like Legos. So you can write one bidirectional flow to do uh, encryption and decryption, and then you can do one bidirectional flow that does encoding from a uh, domain type to a byte string or a, a byte buffer, and vice versa, and you can plug them together to form a new bidirectional flow that decrypts and creates domain objects. Very powerful way of putting together different stages in a protocol. So before I said something about graphs, graphs seem fairly useful, right? How many of you use Git? Most of you. So you use graphs all the time. But the most common form of graph that is used is an acyclic graph. So it doesn't allow back pointers. So it has a directed flow. And you can encode this in Akka Stream. It's fairly, very simple. But there's this other kind of graph that I call the, the, the what graph, because Oftentimes, if you do have a stream processing solution that only allows DAGs, and you need to have a feedback loop within your graph, and you're not allowed to, you output it somewhere, and then you have something that reads that output up in the stream. So you sort of hide the back channel. That sort of violates all the assumptions around your graph, so that's, that's not a good thing. So, since cyclical graphs have their uses, I think it's better to have an abstraction that supports both acyclic and cyclic graphs. So you don't have to do this what thing, where you're trying to debug why it's suddenly breaking because it's writing to some file somewhere that it's being read up, far up in the graph. And Arca streams allow you to compose graphs, and there is an optional setting for allowing cycles. So that allows you to, if it can do some helpful things, like you created a, a, a cycle, you didn't enable this, this is probably a bug. Sort of helpful. But in order to do an interesting graph, we need to have both fan ins and fan outs. We need to be able to take multiple sources of information. For instance, we want to be able to read from multiple files 
and join those files and produce something with that, or we want to split the information and send it to multiple destinations. Very, very common. Both broadcasting and routing and, and uh, essentially, if you do any composition of programs, as I mentioned very early in the presentation, like calling out to multiple services and joining the results of those services, very, very common. So you need things like merge, you need things like broadcast, you need things like zip, zip with, and all, ca all kinds of very core components. So that is also supported. And what's interesting is that it's now available both in the, all right. Where did you go? Where did you go, Mr. IntelliJ? Can you see something? Yes. All right. So let's say we want to do something with a graph. So here's two different examples. One is we have a source from 1 to 100, and we want to zip that, join another source, which has 100 to 199. And what we specify for that is a function that takes the first value and plus it or add it to the second value. So we're essentially adding two streams together using, using add. So that takes two sources and joins them to produce a single source. So from the outside, if you pass this source around, you won't really see that this is what it does as a user of this. So you can really compose very, very complex sources and expose them as a very simple source. But what you can also do using our, our graph DSL, if you want to have full freedom, you can wire things up yourself. So if we want to create a flow, like one input and one output, from a graph, so we create a graph, we have a builder, B, so we can wire things together. We add a zip width stage in our graph. And its behavior is that if it's given two ints, it will keep the second int, the right one. The left int and the right int, and it keeps the right one. And here we have a source that ticks once every second. So it sends an element every second. And the element it sends is unit, or just a placeholder, right? We don't care about the value. We just care that we get one value every second. We can take the clock, which is a source, and pipe that into one of the inputs of the SIT. So it flows from the clock into the in, in zero port of the SIP. So a SIP is a Y-shaped thing. It has two things, two sources it connects to, and one output, right? So if we've plugged one of the sources, all that remains is one input and one output that is unconnected. And we can return that as a flow with the remaining input and the remaining output, and what's, what gets exposed here is now a flow. So we've hidden the fact that there is a clock attached to this flow. So technically what we can do here is we can have our sipping of, of two different sources. We can pipe that through a flow that only runs once every second. And then we print every value that, that gets out there. So let's just try that. All right, this is funny. Oh, really? There we go. Right? Tick tock, tick tock, right? And all these are reusable. You can all refer to them and compose them. Let's not leave that running. 
All right, back to presentation city. Can we actually hide this? All right. So all these fan-ins and fan-outs are composable, which means that you can do some pretty fantastic things. You can create very elaborate graphs of processing, connecting multiple merges and multiple splits and multiple zips, and essentially create your own little quote-unquote streaming processing framework. What's interesting is that I found that doing I.O. is pretty interesting, right? Receiving inputs from the outside and producing outputs, right? But I found that once you have something that takes input from the outside and produces output to the outside, and it's demand-driven, you can't really produce anything unless the receiver or the output is willing to output. So it sort of becomes OI instead of IO, because it's driven by the output. So as I said before, materialization or perhaps I didn't even mention materialization. So when you run a runnable graph, we call that materialization. Because we take this immutable description of transformation and make it come to life. So we materialize it. And materialization has some pretty interesting properties. The materializer itself is pluggable, so you can decide what materializer you want to use. So you could think that in the future there could be materializers that do uh, extensive rewriting of the graph or does some validation of the graph or even takes the graph and analyzes the graph and sees, okay, this part of the graph I can run on that machine, this part of the graph I can run on that machine over there. Right? So not only scaling across cores on the same machine, but also scaling across machines. So Akka Streams really separates the what from the how and when, right? So you have the what, which is the immutable representations of data. The how is doing things with the, with the graph DSL or composing things together. And then you decide for yourself when and where you want to run this. So all of these concerns are separate. So you can think about the sources and sinks and graphs as a sort of a blueprint for a transformation. And the materializer we ship with is uh, using Akka actors to drive the entire processing. So this is also, as I said. So what's interesting about Akka actors as a driver for this is that Akka actors process one message at a time, which is pretty good. And it's OK to send messages from multiple sources. But the actor itself is a single consumer of these messages. And the current overhead of an actor in ARC is about 450 bytes, so it's, it's fairly low compared to most strings. So that means that we can run millions of them on one machine, and technically I think that we can run about 2,500 nodes using ARC cluster. So 2,500 nodes times millions of actors per gigabyte of RAM means that there is a lot of potential scalability. If you had millions of cores, this could take advantage of that. I didn't really show you this, but every single runnable graph has a result. We call that the materialized value. For instance, if you want to have something that connects to uh, a TCP socket, you might want to return what port it got assigned, for instance. Or if you write to a file, you might get a future out with the number of bytes that were written. Things like that. And that value is returned when you materialize. So that, that is typically a future. So illustrated, if you have a graph, and this is a, a cyclic graph, right? Because F, F's output connects back to C's input. Does this make sense? This is like a flow, flowish chart. Everybody with me? Have different stages. We plug them together. Here is the code for that in the graph DSL. 
So if you look at the bottom part, right? If you look at that part, doesn't that look very surprisingly s similar to this one? If you've ever used a graph processing thing before and had to wire things up, it's almost impossible to figure out what it do does just by looking at the code. So we've been working quite hard in trying to find ways of making that kind of code more maintainable. So I will actually... All right, we have 11 minutes. We should be good for this. Are you guys ready for some more live coding? Or, or is this too early or before lunch? Ready. You ready? All right, let's do it. All right. So we go back here. We do something that will require a bit of explaining. So let's say that we want to do something with files, because that is very, very common. Let's say that we have a file called words. Anybody know about words? Words? It's a good file. like that file. It's delimited using new lines, right? So new lines is good. So we want to parse words and do something with it. So we want to parse files. So we define the delimiter for the file. And I'm going to read this file out of my own resources, because I like having things checked in. So the reason why this is a synchronous file source is because have you ever tried to do asynchronous file I.O. in Java? No. Yes. No. Using Netty? So in the JDK, doing this is pretty hard. So this uses I.O., Java I.O. So this is sort of in your face, synchronous. But we want to read a file. So we have a file source. And that file source is in my resources directory of the project, and it's named words. Pretty simple, right? So at this point, we have a synchronous file source of this file. But this is all bytes at this point, because we don't, the program doesn't know anything about the structure of words. So what we need to do is we need to pipe these bytes that we read off the file and do some parsing. So what framing does is that it has a method called delimiter, which takes bytes input and does parsing. Makes sense, right? So we give it what kind of delimiter it's going to look for. We're saying that the maximum frame in this thing, the maximum thing to parse is int max value. Now, I know the English language, and there's probably not that big words, but just, just to be sure. Uh, I could pick the German dictionary. <laughs> that would probably actually uh, generate some more variance in the word length. Uh, but I know also that the last word in words does not have a delimiter after it. So we want to allow truncation. So if the file ends early before it finds a delimiter, we want to include the last word as well. Right? And once we have chunked up the words file into actual words, we still only have bytes. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we take these bytes and create strings out of them. And what's good is that the byte representation that we're using here has a UTF-8 string method that creates a string using UTF-8 UTF out of those bytes. So at this point, when we have the source here, we have parsed and we have words. We have a stream of words. You feel the power? We have a stream of words. But let's say that we just wanted to do the reverse on the other side and just output the words file into a new file. So we have a, stri we have a source of strings now, words. Let's just skip this part for two seconds. Or we can actually go here. 
So when we have strings and we want to output the exact same thing that we read in, now we want to create byte strings or byte buffers from these strings. And what's good about that is we take strings in, we create a byte string, and we want to attach a delimiter to each of them. So now we have a bytes representation of the string with a new line after it. And we can then pipe that into the equivalent destination, right? So we want to create a result.txt in the same directory that includes these things. Does that make sense? We've just read stuff out, we have amazing strings, and now we want to get rid of them and, and, and generate a new words file. But it's pretty boring to have this as a demo because it's essentially a file copy operation, right? We're in the file copy industry right now, right? It's not that fun demo, just file copying. So let's say that we want to do something, we want to output some sort of progress. We, I want to be able to demo. We, we don't want to tail the file and just, oh, wow, it's the things in the file. So let's say that we want to attach a reporter to this transformation. We want to output results here while the thing is running. So we want to create some sort of progress meter thing. So we create a flow of these strings of words, these word strings, and we call an operation called conflate. And what conflate does is that it detaches the back pressure. So the, the, the side can progress independently from each other. So what it will do is if there is no demand from downstream, it will just keep doing a transformation to sort of create a, an intermediate result. So if we are not able to output things in our progress bar, we want to count things. So what we do here essentially is we count the words as they are processed, but it's completely detached to what we want to do with the count. Does that make sense? We just allow it to do stuff while we're waiting to run our progress bar. We want to do a summary. And the progress bar wouldn't be that fun if it just outputted the information about the current progress throughout the program because it would just flood the console. So we want to just have it run every 25 millisecond. So we don't do like every nanosecond or something. So we zip the summary of the number of words processed with the clock and we discard the clock tick. We're not interested in the clock tick, we're only interested in the left part, which is the count. So now we have a stream of the current count of words that we have processed. Oh, we would, actually, that's not what we have. What we have is we have a stream of updates of what was processed since we last checked. But that's not really helpful because we need to keep track of the current progress, not only what happened since the last time we checked. Because that would just be like 1%, 3%, 1%, like that would just be confusing. So what we want to do is we want to aggregate the progress so that it, it, it is increasing. So what scan does is it takes a zero value, which is the start value, and we start out with the long zero. And for every update of the number of, the count of words that were processed since we checked last time, we aggregate that to that count. So now we keep track of the current count that we have processed. Are you with me still? No. Yes, no, yes. All right. So now we have a stream of the current number of words we have processed. And what we want to do with that is we want to sh just print that out to system out as lines read and the count. Right? So we have a source. And now we do also two, because this is a sync. Right? We're putting this into for each. So it just has one open end and no output. So it's a sync. So we want to do source also to progress and then to destination. 
So it's essentially sending information in two directions. So what this should do, this is a small file and this is a fast thing. So as you can see, it prints out the number or the count of words that were processed before the thing exit. And the result was this number of bytes were written to the file. And if we go out into, into this exit presentation mode, what we do, we have words in the file. All right. If you want to try this out, there is a 1.0 out, but we also have a milestone one of 2.0, which has some pretty, pretty cool improvements. If you want to know more about reactive streams for the JVM, this is the link. And thank you for showing up and your support.